Um, yeah, well, I also gave a bit of an introduction how we started. We started off in 1999 when there was a particular piece of grassland which I visited often as a, as a, as a younger man. And um, I, was, I was shocked at one stage to see that it was planted to, to young pine seedlings. And I, in fact, maybe some of you are familiar with the area. It's there close to Nelspreet, Sudwala Caves area. And in fact, those plantation trees were planted right over the cave catchment. So I went to the, to the plantation company. That was many, many years ago. It was in the early 90s. And I said, to, I, I said to them, you can't plant these trees on top of the cave system because surely it's going to dry this cave system out. And in the end, the plantation company involved, they actually did remove some of their trees that was straight over the cave catchment, but they, they, um, they just transplanted it to another area, which is now having a similar impact. Because um, I mean, there's about 50 hectares on top of that cave catchment, which really needs to be removed. And I'll be talking a little bit about that later on, because we did try and get the help of FSC in that situation as well. Of course, they didn't help us. Um, on, on one of the occasions that I visited this grassland, this, this piece of grassland planted to pine trees, eventually it became, I, I, I couldn't really even go there anymore because it made me feel physically very, very sad. I couldn't understand how people could do this, how they can, because what I could realize very plainly and clearly was that as the trees were growing higher, obviously the grassland plants were thinning out. Because the grassland plants are, 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 are dependent on sunlight, and of course they are dependent on fire. So if you move, remove sunlight from that environment, obviously you do that because the trees grow and the canopy closes. There's not enough light that penetrates and it, the grassland plants cannot be sustained. Also fire. If you remove fire from the grassland biome, you kill the grassland. There's many different kinds of plants in the grassland which won't even germinate if it's not been put to fire. There's fascinating plants in the grassland. I think there's something more than 4,000 different kinds of plants that you can find in the South African grassland, particularly there in our area, it's called the Northeastern Mountain Sauerfeld. More than 4,000 plant species that live in that grassland. And here we plant pine trees, one species. To the, to, the, to the detriment and to the death of 4,000 species. There was one particular plant called the Matakwan. It's a plant that normally creeps along the ground. It's a creeper. But in this, in the, in this half-growing plantation, which was slowly killing the, the grassland because of excluding the light, this particular kind of Matakwan plant was trying to strain for the light. And I felt even now when I think about it, I feel sad. Because I know that that plant had no, no chance. Even though he was trying his best to find some light, he was dying. And it was sometime after that that I heard Wally speaking on the radio. And I phoned him. I think first he thought I was some spy from the industry. <laughs> but um, eventually we got together a plan. As he mentioned, we uh, organized this meeting in 1999. And um, we got basically different experts to talk about different impacts of timber plantations on our environment. Impacts on plants, impacts on, on, on people. I think Wally spoke about Kondanambi in that example. Um, the impacts on, 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 on birds. There was a, a guy, John McAllister, one of South Africa's topmost bird experts. And all he did was to go to Robert's bird book, um, these uh, bird guidebooks of a couple of, of years, um, because they, they bring out revised editions every now and again. And just by looking at, the, at, 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 at those books and the distribution of these particular birds, it's just incredible to see how the bird diversity and the bird uh, abundance have gone down in our region. Rats lark is South Africa's most threatened bird species. It's a bird that's reliant upon these high altitude moist grasslands. The Orabi, it's a small little buck species. In, it's on the brink of extinction because it depends on these high altitude moist grasslands which have almost been completely planted to exotic timber plantations of pines and eucalyptus in our region. So at the end of that meeting it was abundantly clear that timber plantations have vast impacts on our whole, on our society, on our biodiversity, on our water resources, 
and I was mandated at that meeting by the people present to keep on circulating information uh, via this network that we had established in, in arranging the meeting. And that's basically how the organization started. Originally, we were known as the South African Water Crisis Network, but we registered officially as Geosphere in 2003. Um, in 2003, we had a, a very nice meeting event that we held in Nelspruit, um, close to where I stay. And there were some international presenters there, including uh, Maria Ritlund from SSNC. And after that, they, we discussed some kind of partnership agreement and SSNC, the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, have been providing support to Geosphere since 2005. 2006, we employed a coordinator in Mozambique. Um, more, uh, Lady Fomi from Mozambique incredibly worried about the deforestation there. Um, at that time, afforestation was not yet taking place, but incredible deforestation. Um, and since then, we've had a coordinator in Mozambique. And in 2007, um, we also had a coordinator in, in Swaziland. Um, Pumalanga, Mozambique, Swaziland, all that's very close to each other, so it made quite a lot of sense to form a, a small sort of regional organization. Um, my, I was incredibly surprised when I learned about the FSC, Forest Stewardship Council. And when I learned that 80% that of our grasslands, as you've seen in the movie, 80% of the timber plantations in South Africa are FSC certified as a responsibly, as a responsibly managed forests. This is despite the fact that it's got these massive negative impacts on our biodiversity, contrary to FSC principles and criteria. Despite the fact that it's got a devastating impact on our water resource, where some of my colleagues in the room live in Bushbuck Ridge, the rivers go completely dry in the winter time. Never used to be like that. Before they planted all the, the whole entire catchments planted to timber. Thirsty, thirsty water guzzling timber trees. So in the winter time, of course, when those impacts are more severe in our region, it's a summer rainfall area. So we receive rainfall in the summer. But of course the trees, they utilize water summer and winter, the evergreen. And they've got these deep rooting systems. Um, some of the trees, have, uh, eucalyptus trees, have roots that's been measured at 50 meters plus into the soil profile. Not far from us, there's a, a plantation called Mkubalan, where they did a, quite an extensive research program a couple of years ago. They established a eucalyptus plantation. Four years after the eucalyptus plantation was established, all the water, the surface water in that region, in that area, dried up completely. So all the little springs and, 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 and streams stopped flowing. When uh, the timber plantation was eventually harvested, it was about 16 years of age, it took five years before the water came back, before the water started flowing out of those fountains again. Just showing how deep the water level has been drawn down by these incredibly thirsty alien trees, of which we have billions in our region. So it was strange to me to see that these timber trees are FSC certified. We've engaged FSC on various occasions trying to, 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 to bring this problem to their attention, trying to bring some of the potential solutions to their attention. Things like diversifying inside the plantation compartment, using indigenous trees. There's indigenous trees that could, use, that could work very well in a plantation setup. Um, if you want to grow them for the, for, 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 for the amount of pulp that they can produce, there's African mahogany that, that grows incredibly quickly um, in the right circumstances. But of course, we worried about the sustainability of our region. Because you cannot keep on planting monoculture upon monoculture upon monoculture without having negative impacts. And we can already see the negative impacts in terms of soil erosion. The river around close to where I live, it runs red, 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 red when it's rained. Never used to be like that. The water used to be crystal clear. Year round. But now because the grasslands have been destroyed in that region, and remember that grasslands have incredibly valuable services, such as water retention. Grassland is like a sponge. When it rains, it holds the water back, allows it the time slowly to seep into the underground aquifers, thereby preventing soil erosion. So you destroy that grassland and you lose out on that service, as we've done, unfortunately, in our province. 
So there's, 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 there's mountain slopes which are completely bare. There's no plants, there's not even soil, it's just rock on those mountain slopes. That's after two rotations of eucalyptus. Um, the, as we've heard today, also the soil nutrients are being depleted. It cannot continue, so it has to change. And I've often thought when, when in discussions with the timber industry that, yo guys, you should listen to us because we sort of, in a way we're on your side, we've worried about your sustainability. We know that these trees will not keep on growing like this. We have to make a change. And the change does or should involve a change towards some kind of biodiversity. A change should involve the reincorporation of animals in agriculture or animals into the system. So one of the things that we, that, that we are quite positive about is, is specifically the use of horses and mules in, in the forestry setup, in the timber plantation setup. Close to where I stay, there's, there's only one team of horses and mules still operational in South Africa. And I'm fortunate that they're less than 30 kilometers from where I stay. They work on a daily basis. Those horses and mules work in the plantations bringing out the timber. We are positive about that because at least there's a little bit of, of diversity in the plantation system. It's the use of animals for agriculture. It's, it's, it, it eliminates that whole carbon thing. It's much less compaction on the soil. It's much more labor intensive because every horse or every mule has a, a handler that handles it. So these are the things that we've tried to, to, to get across to FSC and say, FSC, please, um, we must, it, it, things must change. It cannot continue the way that it does. But we've lost hope and we've lost faith in the FSC and, and, and it seems that even on an international scale, civil society or environmental organizations are not talking much about FSC anymore. And I think it's because it's because we've given up hope. We've realized now that FSC is not a tool for environmentalists. It's not a tool for social activists. It's a tool only for the industry. A couple of examples um, with the Sudwala Caves, for instance. A couple of years ago, it was quite a dry year, and the cave became incredibly dry. It was dusty dry. That the tourists, when they walk in, it was just red dust floating, filtering up. It's never been like that. Even in much worse droughts, 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, there was always water, there was always moisture in that cave. And of course, moisture, it's the interaction between the water and the air that, that forms the cave. That's how a cave grow because of the moisture. If you cut off the moisture, you kill the cave. So this cave was drying out, and I went again to FSC, tried to get the hold of the Soil Association, because you know that, that FSC has got these certifying agents. Um, it's Soil Association that certifies for, 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 for SAPI and it is um, SGS. SGS which certifies Martinland and York Timbers, most of the others. Um, so we tried very hard to get hold of the Soil Association. Eventually they did send uh, a representative out to come and talk to me about this problem. But they sent him with the, the, with the timber industry representative. So it was again the timber industry representative and FSC on, in the one corner and gear sphere on the other corner. And that's normally how it works. Um, the National FSC Initiative here in South Africa, the contact person is a guy called John Scotcher. John Scotcher used to be for years, he used to be the public, the main public relations officer for SAPI, South African paper and pulp industry. And at the moment he's the main environmental consultant for FSA, Forestry South Africa. So he works for the industry but he's the contact person for FSC. And we think that's wrong. We think that shouldn't be like that. A couple of years ago, two years ago, we went to a me well. And actually, it, it, we, we heard about, uh, there was this petition on the, on the, on the internet. It's the first time that I heard about this, the boon killing. There was a scientist who was, who was working on a, a, a researching a troop of baboons. And he's been following that troop of baboons for months, years. I think almost a year he's been following that troop of baboons and they've been sort of getting used to him and they've sort of allowing him to, to come a little bit closer and then he went on leave and when he came back that troop of baboon was gone the whole troop gone found out that the troop was shot by the timber industry and then he, he started a petition online we became aware of it and then a couple of 
uh, weeks later we were invited to this baboon damage working group public meeting by the industry. We went to the industry and we, we heard then for the first time about how, how the timber industry is dealing with this new problem. Um, it's not that new, it started already in 1975 where the timber industry started realizing that uh, some of the baboon troops were damaging specifically the pine trees. And some individuals in some of these baboon troops, they would go in, they would, they would tear some of the bark off the, the pine tree. And they wouldn't really eat them, they'd maybe chew at it, they'd spit it out again, but it would leave some kind of mark on the tree. And then of course, they would, uh, they, they would not be able to use it for the saw logs as they, as, as they used to, they can't send it through the machines because it damages the machine, so they lose, uh, they lose a bit of profit. 1975 they built a big cage, they got a professional hunter in and they tried to kill an entire troop of baboons. But of course the, the, the whole troop wasn't killed, they never, they, they, they could never manage to, to entice the entire troop into the cages. And there was, they, 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 they did tremendous damage to the social hierarchy in these baboon troops. And ever since then, this baboon damage problem has been escalating. It was shocking to us when eventually we came across the figures of how many baboons had been shot in Pumalanga, in our region, just north of Sabi, actually quite a small little area. Since 1975, more than 4,000 baboons had been, had been removed from the timber plantations, the, the majority, majority of those in the last 10 years. Last year alone, there was almost a thousand baboons that was killed by the timber industry. They trapped them in big cages, and a hunter comes and he shoots them with a pistol close to the edge, headshots, until the entire troop is gone. Now, oh, I mean, in the in the first place, you, you cannot imagine how, how a person can 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 kill like that. Baboon is it's one of the maybe it's one of the animals that is still that's still lucky. Because it can still try and move around, and it can still try and eke out an existence, can still climb up the grass. Most of the other plants and animals cannot do that. Many plants are stationary there where the timber plantation is established there, and that's where they're going to die. But of course the baboons, they're resilient and they try. I mean, there's a story, a couple of uh, friends of mine who stays close by, they told me the story about how 11 o'clock at night they, were, they woke up and they saw out it was a moonlit nice moonlit night, sun and the moon was shining. And they looked out of the window and they saw that the uh, entire troop of baboons was slowly and quietly sneaking into the guava plantation. They had a couple of guava trees next to the house. But in the middle of the night, quietly, the baboons came into those guava trees and they, they stole some guavas and they, they, they went out again. In a way, for me, it was uh, sad because it showed me how desperate wildlife is becoming that they have to sneak out in the middle of the night to try and get some food. There in the mountains, Sabi Pilgrim says, that's their place, that's where, that's where they should have food. That's where, that's where people don't go. But unfortunately, that's where timber plantations have been established on such a terribly large scale. So we, 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 we sort of tried all the options that we could within the industry, within the Baboon Damage Working Group, within the Baboon Damage Working Group Committee, but mostly made up of, of timber plantation representatives. Then we tried to, to, to go to the FSC. We said, let's give, give FSC a chance. Let's try and see if they can help us in this situation. So I think it's the third formal complaint that's been uh, ever opened up against this, the FSC because it's quite a process. Fortunately, we had some German volunteers and they could help with the process because it's quite a lot of paperwork to submit a formal complaint to the FSC, but we did it. And um, they were supposed to come back, well, they were supposed to first set up an, 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 an impartial committee. And we could also have input into that impartiality of that committee. We could question the people. So we got a list back. There was, um, there was a Dr. Timothy Sennett and there was a Dr. Dave Pepler. And there was another guy from the tree protection unit there in Pretoria University. So, uh, we first of all, we objected to Tim Sinner because according to the FSC guidelines, an FSC member is not supposed to be on this complaints committee. Um, and Timothy Sinner, he was one of the founding members of FSC. 
and he's personally is not a member, but his company, his consulting company, is a member of FSC. We said, no, surely uh, Timothy Sennett shouldn't be on this committee. He's not impartial. He's a, sort of a member of the FSC. Eventually, that, that, our, our, our request there was rejected. But there was another guy, Dr. David Pepler. And Dr. David Pepler is seen as one of the green guys in South Africa. He presents a program called Groen, Green, on, uh, on one of the television pay channels. So he's got a, quite a reputation as this green environmental ecologist. Fortunately, we, we received from one of our colleagues a few couple of months previous, we received a document called a guideline to baboon culling in a South African plantation. And it was written by Dr. David Pepler. So fortunately, we had this document and we could tell the FSC, but this guy, Dave Pepler, he's not impartial. impartial. He wrote the document, he wrote the, the guidelines on how to kill baboons. You must kill the big ones first, then the small ones. Because if you kill the small ones first, then the big ones go absolutely crazy. It's, it's, it's incredible. It is, that is one of the most shocking things I've ever read from the industry, is that, that protocol, the baboon killing protocol, that was designed by Dr. David Pepler, so-called um, uh, uh, impartial member of the FSC Complaints Committee. <laughs> So we sent a long letter to FSC and they said, they, they, they said okay, we, we, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll remove this guy, Dave Pepler, from the, from the complaints committee and we were pleased about that. But then we were now cautious because of the other people. There was a guy there called uh, Dr. Kobus de Toy. He's the, chair, the chairperson of the Veterinary Ethics Committee. So we wrote to FSC, we said, yes, you guys, you, with, with this Dr. Dave Pepler, you really tried to fool us. What about this Quibus de Toy? He's, did, did he have anything to do with the timber industry? Did he have anything to do with the baboon killings? And they wrote us back after a couple of days. They said, no, 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 they don't think he's, done every, he's, he's ever had anything to do with the industry and baboon killings. But they will send us a CV of his. A couple of weeks later, we received the CV and there was nothing in there about baboon. Nothing, nothing about his work with baboons. So after a couple of months, we received the complaints committee's decision. They said, no, it's okay, the industry can go on, it's sustainable, they should kill the baboons um, because it's impacting on their financial viability. But they, they, they had a long list of references of people or things, documents that they've consulted. And four of those documents was prepared for the timber industry about the baboon killing issue by this Dr. Kobus de Toy. So again, a, an absolutely impartial person was willingly put onto that complaints committee. So the FSC, they had no intention of dealing fairly with our issue. They had every intention of keeping on killing baboons. So what we did was to write the, the FSC board of directors a letter. And we still haven't had a reply from them. But we actually, we, 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 we said that uh, Andre de Freitas, the executive director of FSC, he committed fraud in the setup of that complaints committee, specifically because we had asked for specific information and we were specifically misled by the head of this organization. So unfortunately, we have no more faith in FSC. We do not believe they can be trusted and we don't really know what we can do about it, except to produce these kinds of documents to try and create the Actually, because here in South Africa, there's very few people that care or even know about the FSC. Um, they don't, when they go and look for toilet paper, they don't choose FSC toilet paper. They choose the cheapest toilet paper is the best. But um, in the northern countries, of course, FSC in Europe, in Germany, there's, there's, there's in Finland, in Sweden, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's much more uh, awareness of FSC and the, 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 the good work that they are supposed to be doing. So we believe that it is important to spread the word, to make people aware that FSC is not, is not doing what they are planning to be doing. They are not protecting the world's forests by certifying or destroying South Africa's grasslands. We believe that timber plantations should change because they are not sustainable. After two, two rotations in some marginal soils, the trees don't want to grow anymore. There's places in South Africa where after, after the second rotation, that soil has already been depleted. 
So it cannot continue in this way. It has to change. Allow me just to speak a little bit about the project that we were involved with or that we are involved with in, uh, in, in Mozambique, um, where uh, some of our staff members went on a, on a field visit and they came across this Ntakwa project, plantation project in, in, in Mozambique. Um, Global Solidarity Forest Fund. It is a fund that's been set up or supported by the Norwegian Lutheran Church and the Swedish Lutheran Church and the Dutch and a Dutch pension fund. And they all got together and they formed this Global Solidarity Forest Fund. And their main aim is to establish lots of forests in Southern Africa. And when they talk forests, of course, they are talking about timber plantations. In Zambezia, the specific Ntakwa plantation, clear evidence of how people have been lied to, how people have been promised jobs. Now after three, four years, there's only two people in that entire community who still retains his employment and they are employed as forest guards to keep other people out of the plantation and out of that area uh, so that they cannot have access to that utility. They, be, they were promised a church, of course, no church has been built. They were promised a clinic, there's been no clinic that's been built. A school, there's no school that's been built. So these fake and false promises um, by these multinational corporations grabbing the land, having a big impact on the water resource, having a big impact on the way that those community people live. Because in your natural environment, when you have access to it, you can, you can, you can never be completely hungry. Because the nature provides a lot in Zambezia, in Nyasa province. There's still elephant on the national roads there. But not for much longer if, uh, if large-scale timber plantations get established. I think um, with that I would like to say just thanks again to all of you for listening to me and thanks a lot to Timberwatch and Wally Mena for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.